Hello, Dr. Roseanne Capana Hodge. How are you? I'm doing great. I'm so excited for this conversation because I know it's going to help so many people. And I'm excited for this conversation as well, uh, especially for folks who are uh, trying to figure out how many different team members they should put together uh, when either putting together a care plan for their children or putting together a care plan for themselves. And, um, and a therapist, in our view, is a vital member of that team. Uh, but we'll get there in a second. Uh, but uh, even more exciting to just interview you, I have a brilliant co-host today, Liza Blas, who was uh, one of our past podcast guests on episode 186. And um, she's agreed to be kind enough to work with me today. And uh, my folks know I'm always happy to work with someone other than Matt Sabatello. But for today's episode, I'm really happy to have Liza on. So Liza, I want to say hi to the folks. Oh my gosh. Hello. I am so excited and so honored to be here. This is like the highlight of my week. Well, thank you, Liza. And welcome back to the community because uh, you've been, uh, you've been, you've separated from us, thankfully, right? We're, we're the one community that's always hoping people will separate from us. And, um, you know, and, and you have been blessed to uh, separate from us. So why don't you just share quickly before we go forward with Dr. Roseanne, uh, uh, why you separated from the Lyme community. Yeah. yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, I knew the day was going to come where my kids healed. And um, it's like you kind of, it. I, I always talk about that, you know, to moms that like, you you know, there's going to be a part of your life where you're not in this anymore. And the kids got older, my daughter turned 18. And it was like, you know, this season is done. And um, I'm back in commercial real estate. The kids are doing amazing. Um, my daughter is going to go to college next year. And congratulations. Yes. I mean, it's thank you. It's so, I'm, I'm so grateful. I feel, we feel so blessed. And, um, you know, I do want to, I just also wanted to share with the people who followed me and listened to me that, like, this is a season. Right. And then, and, and there are going to be so many other things for your family and your children. So um, it was just time. Oh, that's wonderful. And we we're so blessed that the neighbor's doing so well. Uh, she was a brilliant guest. Uh, even though she was a young, young person at the time, she was a very, very powerful guest. And I and I'll have to confess that I really enjoyed when she corrected her mom on the podcast. That was many times an enjoyable part of that podcast. <laughs> so, Dr. Roseanne, let's let's come back to you. So, um, uh, our folks, of course, are are interested in learning about your background. So, why don't you fill us in on uh, where you're from? Uh, your accent suggests that you're an East Coast gal, and uh, and let's uh, let's build out um, you know your educational background as well. Yeah, so I am a psychologist, a therapist, an author, a podcaster, um, a founder of multiple companies, including a, um, a supplement company. But I am based in Ridgefield, Connecticut, and for three decades, I've been helping families who with kids that have mental health, physical, emotional, behavioral challenges only using science-backed natural solutions. And I came of that um, because even though I was traditionally trained in my doctoral program, I quickly became known as somebody who helped people with complex cases. And when, you know, in the early 90s, when I was helping kids with complex cases, I realized that psych meds and traditional talk therapy wasn't moving the dial. And I was fortunate enough that in 1997, I had my first chronic Lyme case and I had never heard of chronic Lyme. <laughs> um, and, you know, I thought to myself, what is this? What are these symptoms? Um, sensory issues, processing problems, attention problems, um, social anxiety and inability to wake up on time for high school. How, how could this be? You, you get you know, you get bitten by a tick, you get antibiotics. Um, and in the 90s, they were still very frequently doing long-term antibiotics with a port. And this young man had it. And, you know, being that I was that kind of person and still am today, that I believe that everybody can get better. And when I work with somebody, I don't give up on people. We, I look for solutions, right? I'm a, I'm a, people come to me because I'm a strategist and a solution finder. And so he just opened my eyes to so many of the kids who weren't getting better 
that maybe this was a possibility. And I just sort of dove in um, and, and, you know, all these decades later that, has become one of the base parts of my work is working with people with neuroinflammation um, and educating people, not just about neuroinflammation, but all the ways to help dysregulated kids self-regulate. All right. So give us a little bit more about your background because someone who has a podcast entitled, It's Gonna Be Okay, Really sounds like a New Yorker. So, are you a New Yorker, or are you? Are well, you, I'm. A, um... I was born in New York. I'm daughter of um, Italian immigrant parents, um, and who actually were the only ones in the United States. My whole family's still in Italy because they don't want to come here because we work too much. And um, the week <laughs> I was born in the Bronx, my family moved out to Connecticut, and I actually, after you know, going to graduate school, moved back. Because a nice Italian girl um, who wants to have kids lives down the street from their parents. I tried to buy the house across the street. It didn't happen. Um, and my mom, thank God, um, helped me raise my kids. Um, and little did I know that, you know, after working with kids with um, Lyme disease, that I was going to get my own kid affected by Lyme disease and PANS. Um, and my parents really helped me. So they really taught me that food was medicine. Um, and I'm very much an East Coaster, like get it done yesterday. Patience is not my virtue. It is for a lot of things, but not not for trivial things. Um, and I'm very much an Italian. <laughs> All right. So I knew we had a lot of things that we had in common. And as an Italian American who was born in the Bronx, I'm really happy to have connected with one of my people. Yeah. So let's let's talk a little bit more about your children so we can build out that piece of it. Yeah. Um, and and I'm certainly not going to ask you to tell their story, of course, but if you Oh, but I tell it all the time on my show and and the reason why my show is called It's Going to Be Okay is because that's what I tell all the parents that I work with because they need to hear that. It's very frightening. It doesn't matter what the issue is. It's very scary to see your kids suffer and not be able to find the right solutions and help for them. All right. So, of course, we, we need, need to make it clear when people want to find you, it's not going to be OK. It's going to be gonna. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, so talk to us about your 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 children. Yeah. Um, I want to build out. I want to build out the entire back. Yeah. Well, we got it. Um, we got to talk about Mr. Hodge. Those kids just didn't come on their own. So my well, husband, Chris. They? Yeah. No, they didn't. Um, <laughs> but um, I miss uh, Mr. Hodge, my husband, Chris, we always call him Mr. Hodge. That's okay. a little joke. Um, he's actually my college sweetheart. And um, he's very chill. Because when you're a, you know, you're a type A fiery get stuff kind of done girl, you need a chill partner in life. And he's Absolutely. also really fun. Um, and I have two boys. And Max who has pans and, and really is largely recovered. Um, and a younger son named John Carlo, who is a fully remediated dyslexic. So, um, and, uh, my kids are very much, uh, part of, you know, all the things that I do and family and having really amazing friends, um, are a big part of my life. When you are a pans parent, is a lonely journey. Um, and when my Max really struggled with behavior, about 80% of my friends abandoned me, including my best friend. And it made us what I call Team Hodge. Um, and it also really brought made brought a lot of clarity to the people who should be in my life. Um, and I'm very much a Christian and I believe in faith and I think everybody should have a strong sense of faith, whatever it is, because when you go through a struggle, you need that. Um, and one of the darkest points of my life, when people abandoned me, my friend Shauna said to me, uh, Jesus keeps people in your life and he keeps people out too. And it was just a really pivotal, pivotal moment for me to help me understand the journey can be hard. Um, and Liza and I were talking in advance about how hard the journey can be. But these are the things that I think so many of the people who listen to me, you know, I put a lot of content out there, really trying to inspire people with hope, belief, but also to give them a kick in the butt to take action, right? We we have to take action and do things differently. Um, and so many of us have to 
go through and navigate. Even when my max had Lyme, um, I was very lucky. I had access. I had already been working with Lyme, individuals with Lyme for nine years. Um, and I had access to the top people, but the journey to healing is still very murky. So that's part of what I like to talk a lot about because we need to be clearer about the path to healing and it's multifaceted and there's no magic wand, no matter what is going on. Even if it's straight ADD, it's PANS, it's OCD, whatever is going on, we have to, people have to understand that change isn't always quick. There's not a pill that's going to fix it. There's not a single, oh yeah, this is the treatment. It really requires families coming together um, and getting the right kind of support. All right. So now we have your background um, yeah. and, and all of these pieces that have come together to, um, to bring you to the Lyme community. So one of the things we do on this podcast is we ask our guests to define Lyme disease. And of course, that's one of the things that's um, you know, very um, upsetting to many people in this community because there are so many different definitions of that term. So give me your working definition of, of Lyme disease, Dr. Roseanne. Yeah, well, I won't swear when I talk about Lyme disease, even though okay, I'm a saucy northerner, right? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, essentially, Lyme disease, you know, is a uh, vector-borne um, infection that in, that causes the body to um, have neuroinflammation. It results in a variety of difficulties from neurocognitive, neuropsychiatric, um, physical issues, and it's a complex bacterial-based infection that is genetically evasive and really smart and knows how to hide within the cells. Um, and tick-borne illness, I mean, Lyme disease is one type of tick-borne illness. We need to really open that up because there are different types of tick-borne illness. Um, and that is important because we need people to understand who are treaters, who are frontline workers, that how it affects people. And so we really need a clearer understanding um, on just how that happens. Okay, so I'm going to ask you to react to the tick boot camp definition of, of Lyme disease. And the reason we've come up with our definition is it seems like everyone has the right to do that. And uh, we wanted to see if we could take control of this term because it's used in so many different ways. So here at tick boot camp, we define Lyme disease as a polymicrobial, multisystemic, chronic infectious disease. What would your reaction be to our definition of Lyme disease? I mean, I think that's really concise. I think that um, it really ticks the boxes. I think what's hard about that is it has what I like to call SAT words in it. <laughs> and people may not identify with that, right? So I think one of my gifts is that I've had the privilege and still do work with very young children. So that means I have to dis distill complex concepts in an understandable way. So that's not really... I understand it because I've been trained in Lyme disease since the 90s, um, but I don't know how understandable and relatable that is, that people may not identify themselves as having Lyme disease based on that definition. All right. I, thank you for that input. So Liza, give me your reaction to the polymicrobial multisystemic chronic infectious disease, the three elements of, of Lyme. So what? just to, to add on to what Dr. Roseanne was saying, um, I think mothers who are overwhelmed and and shutting down and, you know, living in brain fog because of this lifestyle, I can imagine, Dr. Roseanne, that you have to also uh, uh, explain Lyme and these types of disorders and behavior that we're seeing in ways that we can understand, too. Because we're just working with brain fog and just no sleep and adrenaline. And so it's like you you got to you got to break it down in a way that we can understand quickly, because all we want to do is heal our child yesterday. So and, and I have had so many questions running through my head, and I would love to kind of like dig into your story about your children. But one of the things that I 
I struggled with as a mother in the Lyme world and in the PANS world is I came from commercial real estate. I didn't know anything, you know, and I also didn't have the time to read like 30 books, you know? Um, and so you were already in the field. You already had, you already had this, all this background online. So tell me a little bit about like your introduction to Lyme. You had mentioned you had seen your first patient um, and then kind of bring us to, here's what you knew about Lyme and how you learned it. And then this is how things kind of changed when I saw it in my own family. Yeah. Well, you know, so the first young man that I had sort of opened my eyes and then you know, I'm just one of those very curious people. I dive into everything. I, you know, I also will read 30 books on the topic. And, you know, back then it meant going to the library and looking at microfiche. The The internet was just in its infancy at that point, right? And so I just started to make connections to other cases. And then it just became part of my protocol. And I think my first next leap was that, you know, I used to do neuropsych testing. So what's my job? Diagnostician, problem solver, putting those solutions in writing in front of people and guiding them through a clear care plan and treatment plan. And so I remember early on, I had this case, the next big case that I had was a young man that when he came to me, he seemed almost like he had multiple personality disorder. He showed up very differently for each of the sessions. And when I did testing, I broke it up typically at about six sessions. So being I'm saucy and a straight shooter, you know, I said to his mom, who was a former nurse, is he on drugs? Like, what is going on? And she said, absolutely not. I am certain he's not because I thought so too. And I tested, I test his hair. So I was like, okay, I'm going to just say something to you may not know about, have you ever thought it's chronic Lyme? Because he has a history of bizarre infections You've tried so many great different types of mental health treatments and nothing has worked. And she goes, do you know that I think about that all the time? And so from that, we wind up getting him proper care, which was even harder then. It's still very hard. And, and of course, that's what it was. And it just explained so many things that were happening. And I then really made that like, okay, I need to learn more about it. I need to find the way to educate others. And, you know, at the time you could go to in-person seminars, groups were already forming. The Lyme community was already forming. Pans and Pandas wasn't really there. You know, it, it didn't even really come on until the nineties. And, and then moms, I always like to say badass moms took control in pans, particularly in the Northeast, and really started to educate people. But when my own child um, in 2006, December of 2006, um, there were still a lot of things that I didn't know. So I assumed in December to, of, of a Northeastern winter that it wasn't possible for him to get a tick-borne illness. And it was a mild winter. It doesn't matter if it's a mild winter. Ticks are now on every continent, including Greenland. I think that's shocking. So I was still learning and I still learn. Lyme and tick-borne illness, pans, pandas, these are very complex issues. Um, and so as, you know, I didn't know my son was bitten by a tick, but he had a dramatic onset of... Um, personality change, restrictive eating. Um, and we already established we're Italian. I mean, I make everything from scratch, always did. Uh, don't buy a lot of products. And he was an unbelievable eater and he just stopped eating. So when I went to my pediatrician, she says, oh, that's normal. Toddlers do that. And I pushed back and I trusted my mother instinct. And I said, no, that's not true. And not Italian kids. And, um, and I just went down that path of getting proper care. Luckily, I knew who to go to. Luckily, I live in the Northeast because tick-borne illness is, you know, named for Lyme, Connecticut. There does, and at the time and today, there continues to be a lot of providers here. Thankfully, there's more and more. But it really was a long journey because what I learned in that journey was, you know, it was still very much traditional 
blast with antibiotics, still very experimental. Um, we've definitely come much farther. I don't think, we, you know, because of the bio-individual components of the disease and because, as I always like to say, when one thing comes to the party or crashes the party, the other things like to crash the party. So most people have a complexity. They have multiple tick-borne illnesses. They might have viruses. They might have, you know, toxins like mold or other weird environmental components. Um, but I had to pull from what I learned. It was once my own son had Lyme, it was really tough to go to trainings. I mean, there were times I would go to trainings and cry and leave um, because it was a different lens. I was there as a, not just a healer, but as a mother. Um, and I think the best thing, you know, as a mother, I was very fortunate that I was raised by just an unbelievably strong mother who really taught me to, she would literally say this, to not give a crap what other people think and really raised me to have no limits to what I could do. And so because of that, I pushed and I kept pushing and I kept pushing for the right answers and the right solutions. Um, and I think that, you know, as a woman, we don't enculturate our women to really trust their gut. We, we enculturate women to be caretakers. Um, and sometimes that means that we don't find our voice. Most women don't find their voice until their forties. Um, and I think it's really, really important for people in this position, whether it's yourself or your child to always trust your gut because the path is murky. Um, and I think that's one of the greatest lessons that I can impart to anybody else and certainly was part of my journey as well. So Dr. Ozan, before you and Liza take this next step, and I, I know I'm anticipating the follow-up questions from Liza, we do have a diverse audience here at Tick Boot Camp. We have some new people to the community. We have some more, uh, more um, experienced folks in the line community, but can you please define pans and pandas for our community? And then I'll let Liza take yeah. the uh, so the Thank step. you for asking that. Um, yeah. So pans, pandas, and autoimmune encephalopathy are all three different conditions um, that have similar symptoms, except pans and pandas have a sudden onset. So pans is pediatric acute onset neuropsychiatric syndrome that can result from um, tick-borne illness or a variety of infections and toxins. Pan does is due to strep, right? And uh, and even though uh, many, there's somewhat of more awareness of pandas um, because strep is incredibly common. Um, most of my clients have pans. And what is it? Like, how is it similar or dissimilar from Lyme disease? I think that's important to understand. And even though the word pediatric is in the word pans, P-A-N-S, we now include adult onset. Um, so it's a misdirected immune response. The body starts attacking itself due to an infection, toxin, or combination of such. And of course, in pandas, it's strep only. And that produces neuroinflammation. And neuroinflammation results in neurocognitive, neuropsychiatric symptoms at the or of pans and pandas, again, is that sudden onset, an overnight change. And this is very important because people do not talk about it. Um, it's not just a sudden onset. It could be a deep acceleration of a pre-existing condition. So you can have anxiety, but then it just goes through the roof or turns into OCD. Um, you can be moody and then have extreme depression or bipolar, you know, symptoms likes. So I think that's really, you know, important to talk about that because that's often why it gets missed because with so many, particularly in pediatric, the norm is neurodivergence, mental health issues today. Kids uh, have this increasingly, right? It's not that we're better identifying, but we have this more. So pans and pandas, 
sudden onset autoimmune encephalopathy is uh, you can have waxing and waning of symptoms before it becomes uh, an issue, but they're all going to affect, you know, the core features are restrictive eating, um, ticks and OCD. And then there is a lot of other symptomatology around it that are really common, a regression of behaviors, um, particularly learning, um, toileting issues that regress, urinary frequency, you can have mood issues, you can have ADHD, you can have anxiety, again, all adding to the complexity. Um, but the thing about pans and pandas, when you have a sudden onset of a problem, this is not normal people. Run to a professional and at least get this, ex you know, make sure that it's ruled out. Yeah. I, I want to ask you one more foundational piece, if I could, Liza, sure. before, uh, before we move forward. Can you talk to us about neuroplasticity and um, and the difference between um, brain development for a child between the ages of zero and seven, seven and 14 and 14 and 25, and why, why neuroplasticity and the radical changes that occur in a brain between zero and 25 make the line pans and panda experience different than it would be if someone were to have an adult onset of these conditions. Yeah. Well, you know, the young brain, right? Neuroplasticity, what is it? Okay. So really that's, you know, the flexibility of the brain. And we have neuroplasticity um, at every age, even as an elderly person. And there are a lot of factors that influence it. Given that I do something called QEG brain maps, which is essentially um, a brain scan that gives me a visual representation of brain waves. It shows me what areas are not working and are overstimulated, understimulated, shows me brain communication. I can tell you that other than a young brain, a brain under age eight, um, that diet is one of the most positively impactful things on neuroplasticity. Nobody wants to hear that. It's easier to change your religion than your diet. But when it comes to brains, right? So the young brain is just, just so open to things and there is a lot of growth. I refer to it as it's unpaved, right? So you put in a driveway under age eight, the brain really is unpaved. There are negatives and positives to that because there's it's more susceptible to things, good and bad. So, you know, what they're, you know, what are positives, right? That we can do, right? So, you know, hugging your kid when your baby cries and you pick it up, it feels safe, you know, diet, exercise. Um, there's so many things that can really help your child. It's also on the negative when we have early developmental trauma. These are some of the people that struggle the most with recovery, but also when ticks happen, this is a brain that is more likely to be impacted because it's growing, right? And, you know, our our brains don't fully, our frontal lobes don't fully develop till about somewhere between ages 25 and 28. Um, and so there, you, this is part of why we see so many kids struggling, but also the two biggest groups of children getting Lyme disease are ages five to 10 and 10 to 13 because they're outside. And the third group is like men in their late forties and early fifties. Um, the research always shows that. So neurodevelopment, you know, occurs along stages. There are positive and negatives, and it is part of the reason why kids are, there's so many positive things we can do for neurodevelopmental growth and neuroplasticity, but it also is part of the reason why kids are more affected because they really have a brain that's unset until about age eight. Wow. Well, and just to add to that, it was such a great question because as you can see, as these, these um, brain development stages, right, your child's going through them. So as a first time mom, you also don't know what's normal and what's not. No. Nope. So 
hard to tease these things out. You know, a lot of our kids already have some type of neurodivergency. It's, you see it as an early age, like, well, my quit, my kid's a little quirky, so that might be normal for my kid. And then, you know, if they do get hit by a tick or other environmental toxins at a certain age, you don't know them going into puberty. You might think that that's just a normal part of the phase, but in, the, but, you know, you might not know that there is ongoing inflammation happening. It's such a true point. And, and especially when it's a first time child. And, you know, a lot of times parents will say to me, like, I didn't know something was up until I had the second kid. And I saw how dysregulated this child was until, you know, I got a kid who actually could self-regulate. And what does that mean? They can go to sleep without being held for an hour. And um, they would sit down and, you know, get started in their meal. And, you know, their communication was different. You know, their mood was different. And we don't know what we don't know. And you need a fishing license, but not a parenting license. It's so true. It's so true. And you had mentioned earlier, you know, when you had gone to the pediatrician and they were like, well, this is normal. The toddlers do stop eating. And I mean, I know I, I defer to my pediatrician a lot and got a lot of bad advice, you know, but it's always right. like hindsight's 2020 of like, and, and I, I didn't, I just so much envy you and your empowerment of, you know, being a young mother and pushing back. I think I wasn't that person back then. And I, you know, it, you know, we, it, we, I've learned so much, you know, and, um, but you know, it's, I think there's just a lot of, um, parents that are just overwhelmed and working and they just, they're just referring to the specialist and you might not get good advice. And Liza, we want to believe them. Yeah. We want to believe there's nothing wrong. You know, um, my max was started talking at seven and a half months. And, um, by the time he was, um, 15 months, like he was talking in three or four word sentences. So it's a little freaky when your kid is like that. But when this happened, he actually was like, mommy, my head hurts at 22 months. So when I took him and then I looked at him and he had these dilated pupils and I knew for my line people, that means that he had brain inflammation, right? So when I brought him to the doctor, right, and and I was like, I'm working this system. I, I had an appointment with one of the most well-known pediatric Lyme doctors, God rest his soul, Dr. Charles Ray Jones, um, who was almost, he was in his late seventies when we got to see him and he practiced until his nineties, right before he passed away. And um, I was like, I need antibiotics, right? Because that's that's what you did at the time, right? And and everyone has different paths. I'm def I'm pro what's right for everybody, right? I'm not against antibiotics, but I think everyone needs a different treatment based on their unique platform, right? Or or, or their symptoms and the different things. And so I went to her and I was like, I need antibiotics. I got an appointment with Dr. Jones. I got to wait nine months. And she said, Well, I'm not going to give them to you. And I go, Well, he's got brain inflammation. And, and she said, yeah. And I go, well, what do you think that's from? And she said, I think that's from allergies. I go, you think brain inflammation, inflammation is from allergies? I was like, are you going to give me those antibiotics? And only because I was Dr. Roseanne and she knew me, I got those antibiotics. Um, and he started to change within six weeks. And I was really luck lucky because I called Dr. Jones's office all the time. Like, I'm 45 minutes away. Get me in. And I was able to get in like in a few, you know, within six or seven weeks. But we we don't trust ourselves. Right. And we're asking an expert, but they're not an expert in Lyme disease. <laughs> they're not an expert in PANS. And it's very different when you go to that. Um, and, and, you know, this is part of the complexity of the problem. It's really hard to find good care, but we have many messages and our gut is very much our intuitiveness and our sense, and it gets muddled under stress and we need to quiet down, connect, right? Because it's only easy to connect the dots when we look backwards. That's what Steve Jobs, his famous quote, one of my favorite quotes and we can't feel bad about it. We can only learn from it and not repeat it. Right. Dr. Roseanne, let me ask the two of you as moms uh, about signals, right? Because there are a lot of signals that we are receiving as parents. Uh, and I yes. think moms, especially Italian moms, 
have a, a whole set of signals that I think you have to deal with. So let me ask each of you to talk to me about uh, guilt, uh, mom guilt in particular. Uh, when you're when you're when you have a child that's not well, and you know the child's not well, and you're struggling to um, to um, find out whether or not there is in fact something wrong with them, where does mom guilt play into this, and how does that interfere with your your signals? Oh my gosh! I mean, I had a family that drove thirteen and a half hours yesterday to see me, and um, talk about mom guilt, right? You know, guilt does not serve us. Um, but it's a factor in all of this and the long and short of it with, you know, in my people, you know, let me talk about them, but I'm not going to reveal all their stuff is that this was a young man, like a very common scenario. I don't know what number doctor I was, um, had somewhat of a waxing and waning onset of OCD a number of years ago, somewhere between six to eight years ago. And the long and short of it was, you know, I'm very detailed in my intake. And I was like, do you have any, you know, rashes on you or stretch marks? And so, you know, when I hear the little signals, I try to ask it sooner than rather than later. And they're like, yeah, he's got stretch marks on his back from a growth spurt. So I look at him and I'm like, that's Bartonella. That's Bartonella. And then in the intake, 100% heard POTS, uh, could see histamine response visually on him with red ears. I could see a lot of things. And the mother was like, started instantaneously crying and feeling guilty. I, how could I not know this? And I said, hold on, hold on. You took him to numerous doctors. You are not taking this responsibility. Those are some sucky doctors. And there were like, Honestly, some criminal things that happened that absolutely people didn't see, even what they thought the problem was, that wasn't even properly investigated. And so when it comes to guilt, it's like anything else, right? Like, you know, I've, I've had to do different things to even mourn the idea of what I thought some of the things would happen for Max, right? You know, oh, I thought all my kids would go to Montessori schools and, you know, they'd be so regulated. I, I did detoxing my husband and I before we even conceived 20 years ago. Nobody did that, right? Good for you. But, but I was always a biohacker. So I'm using science, right, to optimize. But we have to let go of that. We have to process it, deal with it, and move on from it. There's a lot of trauma that happens in all of this. And we we can't let that hold us back because what I see all the time is that it stops people from moving forward, the guilt. And it's not fair. The system is not set up properly. Lance, yeah. what about you? What was your experience with guilt and how did that interfere, if it did, with, with uh, the signals um, you were getting from your gut? Man, I don't even know how to answer this because as Dr. Roseanne was talking, I started tearing up thinking about what I was going to say because I'm going to start crying. It is like, and you feel like, I'm like, my kids are healed. We're all good. But like, if you take me back, I sent my daughter to a camp that then she got like pummeled by ticks when she was already not doing well. And here I am thinking, I just need to get her out there. You know, I need to get her out of her shell. I just think she needs to be put out there. And I mean, she already was having, you know, little bits of OCD, the waxing and the waning, you know, as you talk about that is, and it's actually, it's like the waxing and the waning is so hard to deal with because it's like, it's like the people that have Lyme that never got a rash. So that keeps going longer. And when your child doesn't have a sudden onset and you go through this waxing and waning, you're always like, oh, well, it's getting better now. Do you know what I'm trying to say? And so, and I'm like, this is going to be really good for her. And she, she said she wanted to go. And then my poor child got like hit with like a bunch of ticks in Northern Minnesota. So, I mean, like there's so much guilt and, um, you know, it's just, it, it made me, I mean, I took a stance of, uh, 
th this is like my number one thing. Like, we're going to figure this out. Like I owe this child so much, you know? And, um, it, I think it was hard for the family because I think my husband was also in that seat. I know a lot of people, um, partners are like this, where they're like, there's nothing to see here. You know, like this is not happening. <laughs> this is not happening. And then I just kind of went, I, I, then I became more like you. Dr. Roseanne, you know, I just became more empowered and I was like, get out of my way. That doctor sucks. Next, give me a list, you know? And then I just became more Italian, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. I love it. My, my mom was not your typical Italian mother, by the way, like she controlled the money in my house. Like Rich, Rich would know what I'm talking about. Very unusual. That's for me. That, yeah. that's how I got it done. That's yeah. how I got it all yeah. done because yeah. I did control just because my husband was too busy and he's, he's ADD and didn't want, didn't. And yeah. I, so that's how I got it all done. Yeah. So you were I empowered. Controlled. And yeah. I, I think, I think what happens, like we can go right back to those moments. Like when I filmed my episode on my show of my story, I had to refilm it because I was sobbing in my first one. And, and people were like, that's good. And I'm like, no, you can't even understand me. I was like uncontrollably sobbing. And I was like, pull it together. Like, you know, and it just brings you right back to those moments because we have all that trauma attached to it. But I think you bring up something really important and waxing and waning, right? Whether it's the pre part of it or you officially have a diagnosis is also called flares. And flares are part of this huge complexity and part of the reason in Lyme and pans and pandas and autoimmune encephalopathy that people don't get better because they're not understanding what are the flare triggers? Is it stress? Is it mold? Is it that you're eating something you're sensitive to? Like there's a lot of reasons why people have a destabilization. And so mm -hmm. they like, you know, take two step forwards, one step back, one step forward, two, you know, and what happens is when it comes to parents, it really causes conflict in relationships. I 80% of the families I work with, the parents don't view the problem the same way and they're in conflict. So you have a child who's struggling, you know, they could be, you know, the child could be exhibiting symptoms of rage, you know, out of control anger, psychosis, OCD, you know, maybe they're completely unfocused or very depressed, but they're like laying around and you know, can't get to school, school refusal. These are things that are cause conflict in and of itself. But then you have this sort of up and down, up and down. And parents always are like, Roseanne, what should I do? Should I discipline them? Like there's still this belief that we can like discipline things out of kids, you know? But we don't, you know, like your story is very powerful because you, you're like, oh my God, I put my kid out there and they got bitten by other ticks, but we can't live in a bubble, Liza. I mean- I let my kid go in all these leaves and that's how he got Lyme disease, but he also got in a million times. There's, there's this belief and I don't know enough and I don't know if it's science backed that there are pheromones that some people are more prone to tick bites. We know this, that with mosquitoes, right? Like I could be there. Yep. My husband could be there. I'm going to get bitten 20 times. He's not going to get bitten at all. Right. So there's so many factors in it and, and guilt is an emotion and we can't ignore it. We can't stuff it down. And we have to process it in order to move forward to be healthy families because otherwise we're going to dysregulate and our kids need us to be as regulated as possible. And we deserve that because they're co-regulating off of us. So one of the things we've observed in regularly in this podcast is that after a diagnosis, we have other emotional issues we have to process and the grief cycle generally kicks in. So Dr. Roseanne, can you talk to us about the grief cycle and, um, and how the grief cycle will often interfere with our ability to move as quickly as we want to when we're trying to help our children um, now deal with this newly diagnosed disease? Yeah, I mean, grief is real. And, you know, uh, in the American culture in particular, and I, I work with people all over the world, 
Um, and we are definitely a unique culture. There is the amazing things about being American, but we also expect everything yesterday. We expect a quick fix. Um, and we're not always emotionally connected because community isn't always there in every part, right? I happen to live in the sticks and I joke all the time, um, you know, if I was like laying out in the street, my neighbor would open their door and be like, could you move out of the way? Like you're getting in, you're getting in the way. I don't even know if they would help me in my shishu poo neighborhood. Um, but grief, my favorite, favorite any, if anybody wants to learn more about grief, there is a beautiful Simpsons episode about grief where Homer Simpson believes he's going to die um, because he ate a puffer fish. And he just rapidly goes through the stages of grief. And it's just such a great learning lesson about the grieving process. And there are stages, right? Upset, anger, acceptance. And we have to, whether you're an adult dealing with your own case of Lyme, there is a grief process. Like there may be things that you wanted to do that can happen or has to happen on a different timeline. I frequently, frequently do this with kids that are going to college who are afflicted by Lyme and pans and pandas and can't go on the same timeline as their friends. It's such a grieving process. And parents get so hung up on, well, they must go. And I'm like, wait a second, wait a second, wait a second. We got to prioritize healing because guess what? Healing is has its own timeline. We don't get to predict it. We can do things to make it better, but we don't get to control when that, how that's going to look. And it's not going to fit in conveniently. And a lot of parents make a mistake thinking they're just going to push their kids forward um, out of fear, right? Because they haven't really processed, even when they really understand what's going on, there's sort of this magical thinking, oh, well, they'll get there and they'll be fine. Well, wait a second. Like they couldn't even get to high school. It doesn't matter if they were still a straight A student. How are they going to manage on their own? So grief is very real. It can't be ignored. And we we have to go through the processes um, of acceptance um, so that we can regulate our nervous system to heal. So Liza, what was your experience with grief? And I'm just wondering now that you've you've now been blessed to leave the community, um, did your family have the experience that some of our past guests have shared with us that they had to grieve into the community and then grieve out of the community? Oh, that's well, such a cool Well, I mean, I'm still so much part of the community because of what I do. And um, and we also, you know, like I have a big Facebook group and, and different things. Um, I think that, you know, it's I'm different, right? Because I'm still showing people the way and how to heal and talking about it. Um, I think the larger grief for me, as I mentioned earlier, was the people that just didn't understand. Like I had a good friend um, and she was like, well, why don't you just send him to an institution? And I was like, you've known me all these years. I won't even put a psych med in him. What are you talking about? You know? And, and just, just different kinds of comments that people make out of ignorance, you know, like, and people, there's, there's a way to make a comment, whether it's a friend or a family, like, I don't really get that. Could you help me understand it versus an ignorant comment? So I just quickly just learned to um, make sure that I had the right people around me because otherwise it was going to be upsetting um, and whether you want to call that grief or not. And that took, a, that was really hard on me. I love people. Um, yeah. And it was, I think, of course, my child suffering, my family suffering, but really right up there was the loss that I had. I mean, I lost my best friend, you know, and yes, she really wasn't my best friend, right? Because you got to stick with people. I'm Italian, you ride or die, but um, it hurt. It hurt really bad. It was very, very much something that I had to grieve. So, Liza, one of the things that we've we've seen here on this podcast, uh, and actually, I think we saw some of this in your episode as well, is that um, you have to go through the grief process, and after mm -hmm. acceptance, you create something new, right? And you become a member of the community, and you start to connect with other people, and you start to heal together. 
but then of course you do have to leave the community as well. We want to kick you out. We want you to go in, you know, we want you to be better and we want you to uh, move on with your life without dealing with this label. But there is this process of grieving out of the community because you've made so many connections. And again, we become friends, Liza, you and I, as a result of yeah. this connection, right? And 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 I, I pulled you back in, even though your family has has uh, been blessed to leave us, um, you know, from from the standpoint of having to deal with this on a healing level. So, talk to us about first your grief as a mom, and 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 how your family grieved when you finally when you first came into the community, how you then after acceptance created something new, and then how you had to, if you did, had to grieve when you left the community. Yeah, that's such a great question. So grief for us, I feel like our whole family had to grieve when we were down, right? Like it was a good three, two and a half to three years of healing. I have to say, I was so busy trying to help everybody else, especially my husband, that my grief I, 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 I cried a lot. You know, there are times, I mean, best place to cry is in the shower and in your car, you know, that's like the only time to do it, get it, get it done, like cry it out and move on. But there, I remember my husband having a really hard time because he thought he was going to be on the soccer field and coaching baseball. And I did, I don't, I don't know if I'm the only mom that felt this. I felt like I took that away from him. I don't know. <laughs> and um, I had, I really spent so much of my energy, my personal energy, trying to help my husband process his grief because I needed him so badly on my team. Like, get on my team. This train is leaving the station. I need, I need you packed. I need you to get going with me. And so I spent a lot of my time helping him through his grief. And one of the things I always used to say is, this is how I picture grief. It's like, he, he plays a lot of poker and I'm like, we still have good cards. You don't like our cards. You think we have garbage. This is a good hand. You know, it's not like a straight flash, but like, we still have a good hand. She, my daughter, she's so intelligent. Like, she, like people are constantly admiring all the things that she comes up with. And my son is funnier than anyone you'll ever meet. And he's a huge disruptor in life. And that's what I needed. I needed him to disrupt me, to push me out there, to be a better advocate and a more empowered mom. And the person that really did that was like my disruptive son, you know? And so I was like, we, so that was my whole grief pitch with my husband. I was like, we have good cards. And I feel like other families need to know that like, yeah, this is hard, but you know, they don't look like, a, it doesn't look like a good hand, but what God gave you are still good cards and even great cards. And it's so interesting because Dr. Rosanne, you were talking about the timeline and my daughter didn't get her license until she was 18 and she was um, homeschooled for, uh, she didn't go to school for a year. And when she healed, it's like she got in, we moved, she got a new set of friends. She's graduating high school with an associates. She has a boyfriend. Like the whole acceleration piece of that one year that she missed, the floodgates opened. And that was a timeline I didn't expect. You know, but you're driving and you're going to your boyfriend's house. What? After work? Well, I mean, it was just, I can't even believe those things came out of my mouth. So I think from this really long timeline of waiting for our children, it's amazing how it just, the timeline will collapse when they recover. Um, and so I think that helped me grieve out too, because um, it was, it was, it, you know, really and truly God told me to wrap up the podcast. It was really a message from God. It was like, your season is over. And the, you know, there was just, there, I just needed to do it. Some you, sometimes you don't ask why, you know, you yep. just, you just have to be an obedient servant. And I did. And I'm back in commercial real estate. And then I got busy with my normal, quote unquote, because no one is teenagers, you know, who want to stay out later. 
And now I'm driving around like crazy. And it's just like, I am now like kind of living that life I really did want. Well, you really wanted to have all the anxiety of having a child driving or having a child with a boyfriend and all those other things. That, I'll take it. <laughs> oh my gosh, it's normal. <laughs> I don't have to worry about IVIG. And you know what I mean? Like, um, just like when you compare what your life was and like these things like this of oh, this I can do like it's still frustrating but like I'll take it so I, I, I want to talk to the two of you about dads um as the only dad on the podcast today um you know I I will have to tell you that I've uh, I found myself very disappointed with my male counterparts in the Lyme community uh, and the reason I've been disappointed by my male counterparts in the in the Lyme community is, first of all, I don't really see many dads involved with their children's healing. Yep. Uh, and in many cases, I see dads actually exacerbating what, what I think Dr. Roseanne had called a little bit earlier, you know, the crime of, of medical doctors uh, gaslighting their patients. Uh, and what I find, what we, what we found in so many cases with folks that we've interviewed is as soon as a doctor says the child doesn't have Lyme, then the dad is uh, team, the child doesn't have line and further uh, gaslighting, not just the child, but the mom. So Dr. Zen, can you give us first from a professional standpoint, uh, your thoughts on why dads suck in this arena and why they're so willing to accept a doctor's um, you know, uh, misdiagnosis rather than uh, their wife's or their, you know, their partner's gut and their children's symptoms? Yeah, there's so much to unpack around this. And honestly, it is what I do all the time because I'm always doing intakes and strategy sessions. So it means I'm really doing family therapy. And so the cards are on the table when they're there. And so there's there's a lot of reasons why. But ultimately, one of the reasons why it happens is, you know, a, we're still a society where dad's make more money, like they're the primary earners um, and mo in most cases. And moms maybe with the sick child like this, they're probably not even working anymore, right? Because the kid's barely getting to school. And so one person, like in many families, right? We conquer and divide. So mom tends to be the Google MD here. So they do all the listening of the episodes and they do all the research and they, you know, do this and do that. And dads don't do that typically, right? In my experience, and I've, I've worked with thousands of families and uh, it is most often, 98% of the time, it is a mom calling me, right? Um, <clears throat> and still to this day, many of the times when I do intakes, only the mom comes. Now, it, more and more dads come. Like I, the family I had yesterday, they were amazing, mom and dad. And they had equally done the work, right? So mom did the pre-work. Then she was like, you need to listen to the pants. Pan you know, you need to listen to the OCD track. Like she had done that. So dads don't always get the same education about what the problem is. So when they go into the appointments, right, they are not, they don't have all the knowledge they need. That is one of the biggest obstacles, right? Then on top of it, you know, dads tend to want to be careful fixers, right? And so the doctor says, this is okay. Uh, this is what it is. Um, there's only band 41 here. So it's not Lyme disease. It's not tick-borne illness, whatever it is. Oh, they didn't have a, um, uh, you know, they don't have a bullseye, you know, all the BS. Um, they want to believe it, right? We don't want to think our kids are physically ill or mentally ill, right? The other part of things with neurodiversity being so much on the rise that a minimum of 25% of the U.S. population identifies as neurodiverse, 50% of kids today have a physical or a mental health problem. And that's from 2011 data. Um, they also have these things can run in families, right? So when somebody has a history of like ADHD or mental health issues, you know, there's two ways to approach it, right? I'm okay. So this kid's going to buck up and be okay. Even though this ain't 1970, 1980, 1990, where it's pretty easy, it was much easier to get through school. Um, or 
I want the best for my kid. I want to make sure they don't have those same struggles. I'm going to get them all the help. And, and so there's just so many factors. Then we have the outside family and friends that give you misinformation, right? And, and so when it comes down to it, you know, 80% of the time, the couple just doesn't see the problem in the same way. And those factors play into it. And um, so, you know, they, and, and also let's be honest, you know, treatments are expensive. And so dads are like, I got to work more. I got to make sure my job is there. And so they're not always able to get to everything either, even when they want to, you know, it's part of why I, when people are in our program, um, I don't do phone calls. I only leave audio messages so that I ensure both parties listen to what I have to say. Um, it's been a game changer and has stopped a lot of stuff. And I make it really clear that both, both everybody who's there, if you want to bring grandma, yesterday I had grandma in the intake, love it. But we are not always up to date on our information. And also we're a culture, again, that believes in quick fixes. Um, doctor is the king of the hill. Uh, you need to be on the top. You need to be the CEO of your mental health, not that damn doctor. No offense. You should, you should when you find a trusted provider, and who's aligned with you um, and, and helping your child get better, you should trust that doctor. But until you do, you better make sure you're the CEO and you better help your under your partner um, and hopefully your team uh, to understand that's the case. Is that helpful? I think it is helpful. Uh, and and I'm going to, I'm going to give you a dad's perspective after I give Liza an opportunity to give us her thoughts on why she thinks her husband's uh, experience may have been different than hers and uh, what role he played that may have been positive or what role he may have played that may not have been so positive. You know, my husband actually told me why years later, like recent, maybe a year ago, he told me why he wasn't so involved and let me do it. And it's because of what you said, Dr. Roseanne, because they're fixers. And he couldn't fix it. And it made him feel like a failure as a father. So he, and, and he didn't know this at the time. Like, do you know what I mean? Like, it, this is like after reflection and, and some, some space between like the moments of crisis. And he's like, you know, I just, like one of the things that I hate feeling is guilt. This is my husband saying this and failure, failure as a father. And I couldn't fix it. And I'm like, my whole thing was like, well, I couldn't fix it either, but I just kept trying. Like, you know what I mean? It's like, that's, that was the difference between our dynamic is he was like, I'm a failure. I don't want to feel failure. And I'm like, well, I am a very good failure person. I fail all the time. So I'm just going to keep running off cliffs until something sticks. Like it's not going to stop me. Um, and that was just the difference in our dynamics. Um, you know, like, he, he, he just, my husband was just a very smart person that always got A's. I was one of that, per, the people that had to work very hard, you know, to, so I just had, I think I just had more failures in life. <laughs> and so oh, but, it didn't stop me. Yeah. But I think there's another piece I, I'd like the two of you to address. And I'm just I'm speaking from my own experience. Um, and that is that I think mom and moms and dads really have a different role in their children's lives. Right. And um, you know, and again, I'll speak about both my mother, a very ethnic Italian woman, first generation Italian woman, but also my wife who is not Italian. Um, they could never say no to their children, right? And and I think my father's perspective, and certainly my perspective as um, as you know a parent in in this partnership, is someone had to say no. Someone had to allow the children to you know suffer some failures and learn their lessons, and ultimately you know stand up on their own two feet. And I I, I can tell you. But I have a daughter who's a lawyer and very successful. And my wife would still be sending her money if 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 I didn't say no. I have a daughter who's a doctor, my wife, who's also very successful, and she would continue to send the money, right? I mean, and 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 um I, you know, at some point someone has to say no. And I think most men, most dads believe we're the people that are gonna say no. And maybe you're saying yes a little too much. Maybe you are, maybe you need a different perspective. So uh, Dr. Zan, I'd like you to first uh, comment on on my perspective that maybe it is in that balance where we get to a good place 
and someone has to say no. And in most cases, it's the dad. Well, I think, you know, listen, we inherit our parenting style from our parents, right? So I think everyone parents differently, right? I mean, my parents said no to me, Rich. So all right. My parents were like, we paid for your degree and your wedding. You're on your own. I mean, I'm a hundred, you know, like it, it's every family is different. And I think that, you know, the other thing I see with dads is that when I do these meetings, dads are completely incredulous that the, that they're the stupidity that goes on in the medical and mental health field. And they can't believe that they've gone to these qualified degree professionals and it's taken so long to find an answer. So I think they want to believe more than moms because let's face it, most people, you know, work for corporations and, you know, it's, it's a harder, harder process. And also too, men are taught like they're disciplined differently, right? Boys are disciplined. So like there's a harsher discipline. And so they often believe one of the largest conflicts I have is about, you know, again, I said this earlier about disciplining out of kids. So they're more likely to believe that it's purposeful behavior than a mom who is generally more of the caretaker, generally more connected. So when you say, you know, saying yes or saying no, your wife, she just has a generous spirit. You know what I mean? Like, I don't look at that as a bad thing, you know, um, and you have it and it's not hurting you. So spread it around. I'm, I'm, I'm a believer in, in giving to charities and things too. So I, I don't view it in the same way as you, Rich. I think that there's just a lot of things we bring to the table to um, that help us or hurt us in this process. But I also want to be super clear to individuals seeking treatment and parents seeking treatment for their kids that the system sucks. Like we are not where we should be. This is a medical problem that yes, there's complexity into it, but we have moved much farther, but yet there's so many people who, you know, question it, you know, I'm in all these Facebook groups and I'm in one for OCD therapists and, you know, they're like, so, you know, pans pandas is like very um, controversial and it's still not proven. I'm like, yes, it is proven. Okay. There's just some people who challenged the NIH research without their own research and it's become a controversy. So, you know, I think ultimately in the end when it comes down to dads is, you know, they're very serious. They're all business. It's one of the reasons why they like me because I use a lot of metrics and things like that. And I know how to speak the dad language. And um, if the system were better, I think we wouldn't have as many conflicts. So let's let's take the next step together. Um, I, I'd like to, Dr. Rosanna, I'd like to give us some insight into um, team building. Um, you know, one, one of the things that, that uh, I'm often concerned about in the Lyme community is that we hear people saying you have to become your own doctor, right? And, I, and, I'm, and I'm always like, oh, no, you don't. You know, we, we, what we need to do is we need to recognize that we are the captain of the ship. That's that right. We're going to build our team, but we're not qualified to be our own doctors. Nope. And we shouldn't be, we shouldn't be. Um, you know, walking around with that mindset. But because so many people have been failed by the medical system, you know, I I, I do appreciate your your academic uh, term. It's sucky in many cases, right? <laughs> so so um, so, can you give us give us your thoughts on yeah. on on how to build the team and who should be on the team? Because we here at Sick Bootcamp have been arguing that um, you when you're going through this this challenge. Uh, yes, you need you need medical doctors who are trained medical doctors, but you also need to have a trained psychologist on your team. And recently, we've actually been arguing that you really should consider also bringing an herbalist onto the team. Uh, but you, you you need your teammates, and the 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 medical doctors are trained to um, to help you to um, to treat your body. 
uh, but they're not trained on how to uh, treat your brain. And your brain is going to be, in my view, an even larger element of your healing journey. And if you don't have uh, a therapist on your team, um, your your journey is going to be much longer. So Dr. Zhang, give me your perspective first on, on the this, hey, you have to be your own doctor piece, and then give me your perspective on uh, on team building and who should be, who you'd recommend uh, be on the team. Yeah, such a great question. And this does come up all the time. And I know people have been burned, right? So there is a difference between do it yourself and being in charge of picking those experts on your team. And what you need is expert guidance. You can't just go to some health coach. You can't just Google MD it. You need to be informed and educated. Absolutely. And, you know, there is good information. There's great books. There's leaders in the field. But you need proper medical intervention. And when it comes to pans and pandas, you know, Lyme disease, I talk about a five-pronged approach. Um, and that those five prongs need people in those spots, right? So it's, you know, addressing infections and toxins. It's uh, your immune system. It is um, your mental health, your, you know, behavioral parenting support. And you, you have to regulate the nervous system. If you don't regulate the nervous system. And of course you have to have, uh, you know, reduce in, uh, neural inflammation and improve detoxification. But when we're not calming that nervous system down, no healing can occur. It's called psychoimmunology, the study of stress and its effect on the nervous system. And so we, that are there many things there that you can de, you know, do it yourself. Of Course, right? We can do breath work. We can do yoga. We can do heart math, which is biofeedback. I mean, that's what I teach people all about all these ways to regulate. We also um, need to be kind to our minds. We need to say kind things to ourselves, but we need proper medical care. And I am a huge fan of herbs. I'm also a huge fan of, you know, IVIG, right? We need immune modulation therapies, um, uh, antibiotics, but what I want to say about herbs is there's amazing research out of the University of New Haven showing the efficacy of herbs um, in relation to different um, uh, antibiotics in comparison to it. And it, it's more targeted, but a multi-pronged approach as overwhelming as that feels to people is how people get better, right? I don't often see people who do, you know, a long-term course, course or antibiotics or you know, X amount of IVIG treatments and just getting better, like, and never having a flare, right? Um, so it's important, educate yourself, get expert care. There are more and more experts, thank God, um, and trust your instincts and, you know, build not just that team of experts, but like be in a community where people understand you and don't challenge you and say stupid things like you should put your kid in a psychiatric facility. So Liza, as when a, as it's a, not two, necessary. Yes. So, so right. Liza, as a two, as a two time veteran of uh, Lyme parenting, um, you know, I, I'd like your reaction to uh, Dr. Brian Fallon's study, which indicated that the average child who is diagnosed with Lyme disease must see seven practitioners before they are diagnosed with Lyme disease, and how that can often put a parent in a position where they may understand the sentiment that you know you have to become your own doctor um and um and and add to that or couple onto that the medical gaslighting that's probably happened seven times before they finally get that diagnosis and why that may be a sentiment that we understand but it's one that we probably need to discourage for all the reasons that Dr. Roseanne just pointed out where you really need to have a team of experts guiding you through this process rather than you using your own trial and error to try to either treat yourself or treat your child? Well, I can tell you my record is uh, one time I was the 55th provider. And I would say that most of the time people are coming to see me, they've seen 12 to 20 providers. And when we, in that study, right? So it's on average, it's five to seven before anybody gets a Lyme diagnosis. You know, who are those five to seven 
people. So they're pediatricians or primary care providers. And I think the problem is, is the community doesn't understand that the average layperson, there's so much misinformation. Oh, a tick must be engorged. Oh, it must be on you 24 hours. Oh, you only get it in the woods. Oh, it's only in the winter, right? So there's this, this overall misinformation and doctors don't have proper treatment. The same family that came out to me yesterday, they saw a number of doctors, not one of them was infectious disease and not one of them recognized Bartonella, right? I mean, this is so observable, right? And mm -hmm. even if it was stretch marks, so what? He's got all the other symptoms, get him tested. So I think when you, when I hear this, right, and, and the frustration that leads to doing it yourself, you have to think of it differently. I'm going to be in charge of finding who that right provider is. And, you know, many people try to consistently go back to those old providers. You need expert care. Expert care means this is somebody who knows what they're doing. They're highly experienced. They're not a novice. And that's how you get better. Yeah. Liza, give us give us your thoughts on on that. And what was your experience with with doctors and sort of whether or not you felt like you needed to be your children's doctor? Yeah. So it's it's so true. It's very frustrating. You see a lot of doctors, but my thing, I took this mindset of yes, it has to be a team. Someone has to be in charge. Just like the very basic things. We need a team. Somebody needs to be in charge. And at any given point, I'm kicking people off the team. That was just kind of my attitude because they're changing, right? And the and and I think for me, what finally, especially for my daughter, the older one, Ava, who really had it a, a, a worst case, so complex. I'm like, we need to level up here. Every doctor is going to take you to a certain place. And then it like, you know, if you're healed or you're recovered and you can manage great, but sometimes just like that onion layer, you know, you kill off Borrelia, Bartonella is, is now taken stage, get like, get, put the spotlight on me. Right. And then you have mold and then obviously the pans piece. And so by the end of it, we, we and we did piecemeal a lot. And I, and I, and I didn't like that part, but like, that's just what, what the journey did for us. We, we piecemealed a lot. Um, but my one constant was our therapist who was my daughter's therapist and became our family therapist because to heal the child through therapy is also to heal the family dynamic. And everybody's got to get on that same page. Like everybody in the fish tank is going to be affected. So, you know, it's better to go through it together and, and be on the same page. But, but ultimately for us, I had to find a doctor that understood pans and Lyme and Bartonella and could treat all of this. Um, cause I couldn't do the piecemealing anymore. And that is I found that hard to find when I find hard. the doctor, you know, um, it, it was great and it's, it's not cheap, but it's oh. like, it doesn't like, it's an investment. Like we, we need, you know, like it has to be done. So, you know, nothing, of uh, nothing's covered by insurance and supplements are, are expensive. You're not, it's not a $15 copay, right? We all know that. So, um, I think finding a doctor, a medical doctor who can, who has years of experience with the brain inflammation, the OCD, you know, a lot of people are also falling into the world of autism by the time That's right. they get to this place, plus the Lyme, plus the mold, there are doctors that do it all. So, Dr. Hussain, you actually you actually dropped a gem that I don't want to miss. Uh, in fact, I want to build out together uh, during your last answer. Um, and one of the things you talked about um, was that the brain, your nervous system is going to control your immune system, right? So let's talk about that a little bit more because uh, the way we, you know, the way we articulate humanity uh, I guess with language is we describe ourselves as a spiritual being or we sp describe ourselves as an emotional being. Or we describe ourselves as a physical being, but the truth is all of those things are merged together. Right. 
So I think one of the reasons why people do not initially put people like you on their care team, in fact, we at Sick Boot Camp are constantly, um, constantly observing patterns of success. And what we find is that generally the people who are successful go through a process of prehabilitation before they go through this process of killing. And we think the most important person on the prehabilitation team is a psychologist. Because the psychologist can help to regulate the central nervous system and the regulated central nervous system then allows the immune system to function at a time when you're going to go through the killing phase. But because we distinguish the body from the brain or the physical from the emotional, most people don't understand that if you do not regulate the nervous system, you're not going to have success healing. So can you build that out a little bit more? Because you touched on it very quickly. And I was like, wait yeah. a minute, this is important. Well, can I say, fact- say amen? You did such a great job, Rich, of saying that. And really, honestly, this is my whole life's work. I mean, my tagline is calm brain, happy family. Um, and that's across, it doesn't matter if it's tick-borne, it doesn't matter what it is, if neuroinflammation isn't there, whatever, it doesn't matter. So- it is so important. And um, and I'll, I'll share with you after we talk about this, how I even came to this of, of going into uh, the study of psychomonology, but the way the autonomic nervous system works and like just a very basic understanding of our ANS, it, it controls our stress response. And when our nervous system is regulated, it is what is in a parasympathetic state. I call that the hot tub state you're relaxed, you know, everything's working right. But when we move into a stressed state, it moves into a sympathetic dominant. And it is perfectly normal to go into a sympathetic state and then go back down. So everyday stressors, right? You know, I'm a Northeasterner, some, somebody's in the passing lane and they won't get out. You know, I'm going to go into a sympathetic dominant state, even though I can talk myself out down and then, you know, they get the heck out of my lane and I'm better. Right. So that goes in, that's, more commonly, we, that's more commonly known as the fight or flight state. Right. Well, you don't have to be in a fight, flight or freeze state to get into that. It's just an activation. You're going into a sympathetic dominant. But when we have compounded stressors, we have trauma, we have infections, we have things that cause neuroinflammation, our nervous system starts to move in a constant, what I call rev rev state. It goes always in a sympathetic dominant. It's always at the tippy top. Now, when you are go to an extreme activation, you go into a fight, flight, or freeze. Some people are adding fawn, but I'm going to just stick to fight, flight, or freeze. And when the, the more the nervous system activates without going back down into its resting state, the more it's going to activate. Now, let's talk about when there's tick-borne illness. Let's talk about when there's mold. Let's talk about what happens in a, with neuroinflammation, right? Your nervous system says, wait a second, there's some kind of stressor going on over here, right? It it says, why are you in a sympathetic dominant state all the time? Why is this, we're in fight, flight, or freeze? And what I like to kind of, if you can visualize, it's like the troops leaving the encampment, right? Leaving the base and going to figure out what is the heck is going on. And what are the troops? It's your immune system. It's your hormones. It's your neurotransmitters. Everything leaves and tries to figure it out. So what does it leave? It le- abandoned those tick-borne illnesses. It abandons the mold. It abandons like, uh, you know, your vitamin B, all these things run amok in your nervous system. So when you regulate the nervous system, and I'll lift, list off some ways to regulate it, right? Because I'm not just a psychologist. I'm really a brain biohacker. And I teach people how to go, you know, t- I'm all about self-regulation in every aspect, right? But when you start to regulate the nervous system, those resources go back and the body starts to heal. And being that I was always the person that everybody came to with complex cases, I gravitated towards brain-based tools like neurofeedback, PEMF, biofeedback. And of course, being that I'm in the Northeast, I always had Lyme people, whether I knew it or not. And when I did know it, they would come to me because they were so stressed out. They had OCD, they had depression. And I would help them to self-regulate with brain-based tools. And all of a sudden, 
they were physically getting better. They're, they were coming off their antibiotics. Their joints weren't hurting. The head pain was gone. And really, it was because the nervous system was regulating and the body could start to heal itself and it amplified the efficacy of herbs and antibiotics and whatever else they were on, right? Um, and I think it's so important for people to realize that because when you're in such a such a highly stressful situation, whether it's yourself or, or you're the parent, you don't want to invest. You don't want to slow down. And the nervous system needs you to slow down in order for it to work properly. Um, and, and I hope that's helpful for people. And there's so many other ways to do it too. It's not always easy to do breath work. It's not always easy to do meditation. And it's just critical right? For you to do these kinds of things and very intentfully, and it has to be a bare minimum of 10 minutes a day. We need at least 10 minutes. I say when you have a clinical issue like Lyme or pants and pandas, it should be 30 minutes. It could be broken up in different ways. Um, and cardiovascular, like running and weights, that's not the same. It has to be powered down. You have to get into that sit parasympathetic state in order for the body to heal. So Dr. Roseanne, um, so let's talk about again the 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 prehabilitation phase versus the uh, versus the kill phase or the yeah. or the um you know we, we like to call it the the assist phase where we're assisting our immune system, right? But just get, from a conceptual standpoint, if if you again your 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 immune system is um is being is being suppressed because your body is in fight or flight, right? Again, I, and I know you, you're not a fan of me using that term, but I'm gonna stay with it anyway. No, no, I'm a big um, fan. I'm I'm a big fan, but sympathetic dominance, whatever you want to call it, that's the extreme version of it. Many right. of us are in that. Right. So it, I, I think most more commonly, right? The, the, it's moving away from the scientific terms, you know, most people would commonly call it call it rest and digest and, and fight or flight, or you know, so the so the so the sympathetic expression would be the fight or flight phase, and the and the parasympathetic expression would be of, of your nervous system would be the more rest and digest. And I understand it's more complex on both sides of that, but for those of us who are using it, you know, as lay people, that's generally how we know the know the terms. And and I, I want you to talk a little bit about um, about the uh, about chronically uh, uh, when, when you're chronically in the sympathetic expression of your nervous system, how that's shutting down the digestive system, how it's shutting down the immune system, and how you get into this loop through the HPA axis, which yep. in many cases puts you in a position where. Uh, we had one doctor, I think it was Dr. Rawls, who who compared um, someone who is chronically, um, you know, suffering from, uh, you know, adrenaline injections into your system because your cortisol receptors are ultimately being deformed, just like somebody who is suffering from, from having, uh, you know, liver damage as a result of being a diabetic, right? Where your insulin receptors are very much yeah. like your cortisol receptors. And what happens is you're now in this hormonal loop that makes it so that um, you're in this chronic phase of, of, of uh, you know, the sympathetic expression of your nervous system, and it's shutting down your ability to uh, have your body fight off the disease, which is ultimately where the only way that you're going to be successful. So can you give us your thoughts on the HPA axis and, yeah. and how this chronic loop could, uh, you know, could, uh, could, uh, be what's causing you to be sick and unable to yep. fight off these these germs. Yeah. And, and you know, um, because I do these brain maps and you can actually see what happens to the brain when they are stuck in sympathetic dominance. And, and the brain, sometimes I see it when it's in this super active looping phase, like particularly for people with OCD. I also see my people with chronic infections having very worn out brains, but what happens is in our, in our, you know, how do we, beyond the actual um, autonomic nervous system, what actually happens when we face a stressor, right? So whether it's real or imagined, we experience a stressor, right? Like, oh, I left my, you know, keys on the top of my car. Oh. And all of a sudden we shoot up all this cortisol, right? When you have a healthy system, the cortisol shoots up. Um, it, our frontal lobes will say, oh, yes or no, that's a threat. It helps to mitigate it. When 
we have a system that's in this, you know, or HPA access where we're just in this dominant state and we're constantly stressed. Soon as we have a real or perceived stressor, right, we are, we jack up our cortisol, right? The more cortisol you use, the more you need and the less sensitive your body is even to that cortisol. So your frontal lobes over time basically are like become worn out breaks. And then in our brain, our occipital region is supposed to save us with feel good brain waves and kind of smooth things down. And in fact, what happens is it gets worn out and, you know, we become so physically worn out our, um, our gut microbiome stops working. We already talked about the hormones. We talked about our neurotransmitters and all of these factors, we deplete many nutrients, particularly magnesium, vitamin D, the most used nutrients in the body, and everything starts working against us. And it really is a job to repair itself. And, you know, I love the idea that you, you know, think of um, nervous system regulation, getting it to calm down. Um, whatever you want to call it, um, that it's the pre-treatment. And I see people in all phases of treatment. I see people in crisis where there's just extreme dysregulation, either understimulated behaviors like depression, you know, those kind of things, or rage on the overstimulated behavior. I see people that are then in various degrees of getting support. They're 50% okay. They're 90% okay. And they want to get to a hundred percent. And, you know, this idea that nervous system regulation is critical in healing is something that even physicians are talking about, right? I did an interview um, with Dr. Richard Horowitz and he talked about it as a critical component of healing. And we are only using 10% of our brain. And we are only in conscious awareness five to point oh five percent of our time, and our subconscious is running the show. But there are many things we can do to be kind to our mind, so that our bodies and our brain can work better. And that's really so critical. And something that whether it's mantras, when people work with me, everybody gets their own mantra. Um, Some of my moms tell me they walk around the house going, it's going to be okay. It's going to be okay. It's going to be okay. But these are all things that people have a lot of power, right? And all of the things we talk about feel overwhelming, but when we integrate that in in our lives, it's a lot easier than being in a state of overwhelmed and then disconnect. Um, So I'm really grateful for this conversation because I feel that it's so empowering And it is something with guidance. People can really make huge, huge shifts in their healing. So Liza, I'd really like you to give us some insight into uh, how important the therapists were in your life, in your children's lives on their healing journey. Yeah. And and why you think, Liza, that uh, that, uh, your children would not have had the success that they had if you didn't have... uh, yeah. someone like Dr. Roseanne on your team. Yeah, so, so good. And I think this whole um, nervous system thing, I just wanted to add to what Dr. Roseanne was saying, because you had said, Rich, that it's a cycle, right? That you're on this wheel and we're talking about the nervous system. And this is what I um, think was such a big game changer in our family is, and I used to talk about this a lot on my podcast is to get off the wheel and help your child regulate, you as the mom have to regulate. You are the person that can like change the dance. I always used to talk about this. We're in a dance with our families, the dance being like these dynamics of like, now we're all stuck in our cycle and everybody's got their role of dysregulation. And it just, if you shift, and you change the dance, then they all have to change the dance. They don't even know they're doing it. And that is like the, one of the most empowering things about being the mom is like, you have that much influence. You don't even need to talk about it. You just need to start changing the dynamic, start regulating yourself. And when, when your kid does something and you're normally like, stop, 
do it. Like you just change it. Like, I don't know what the right answer is for everybody's family, but there's just like, it's amazing how much influence you have over your child's emotional or nor I'm sorry, not emotional nervous system regulation. Like you don't even know how much influence you really have. And with the proper training by people like Dr. Roseanne and the therapist we had, you unpack that it, that is, that is almost like the kind of like in a lot of families, the missing piece to recovery. I and couldn't so, agree more with you, Liza. Yeah, Thank yeah. you for sharing that. It's so true. It is so true. And like, you know, all of these pieces are so important. The herbs, the inflammation, the supplements, the magnesium, but the, getting that nervous system in place. And I, I couldn't have gotten there without the professional help of my daughter's therapist. And he, you know, he, he wasn't even like, sometimes we're like, we need a, we need a specialist, a special therapist that understands this. You know what? I didn't have that. I just had somebody that was willing to try, who really cared deeply about helping our family. And I was like, well, my daughter's hallucinating. And this is even before she had the Lyme diagnosis. And he was just like, all it is about is like, Liza, do you feel safe? And I was like, no. <laughs> He's like, well, how do you think she's going to feel safe? And it was like all about this whole conversation about feeling safe and like, you know, and not being crazy neurotic, like, and, but also not being dismissive. Like some parents are like, kick it off, shake it off. You're fine. And there is like this sweet spot in the middle that your children need that you have to figure out. Um, and that is really, I mean, it's kind of like a little detour and how this heals your family, but it is so true. It is about your nervous system doesn't feel safe. We don't feel safe. And, and so yes, to, in order to help my children feel safe and get that nervous system feeling safe, I, that's all the work I had to do. So helping my kid was like all this work I had to do on myself. So Dr. Roseanne, I want to throw some gas on the fire before we before we uh, leave the conversation. Um, and uh, I want to talk a little bit more with you about medical gaslighting, uh, because uh, almost every one of the guests that we've interviewed on this podcast, and as I shared with you, there are more, more than 400 of them, have said at one point during their journey, a doctor has said that, they're, that they're, um, everything is in their head, that they're not sick, that it's all in their head. And we here at Tick Boot Camp uh, generally see that as double gaslighting. The first thing it does, of course, is it it makes the patient feel um, unseen. Uh, but the second thing it does is it pushes them away from, as you now know, we think away from the person we think is the most important person on the care team. Certainly at the at the early stages of this, which is it pushes them away from the the, the psychologist who need to help them to regulate their system, right? Uh, because somebody's telling them that they're crazy. Uh, they they are they're now repelled from going to a, uh, a a psychologist and therefore less likely to get the care they need in order to be able to ha have the uh, nervous system regulation that will allow their immune system to now work in and attack the um, you know the bugs. So can you give me your perspective on the disrespect that uh, that medical doctors are um, are um, engaging in not only to their patients but also to people in your community? Well, and I have to say, I don't believe it's just medical doctors. Mental health isn't there either, right? So as great as it is for nervous system regulation, when it comes to infectious disease, when it comes to PANS, you know, PANDAS, Lyme disease, we need mental health providers to be educated about what these things are as well, because we are the frontline workers. All of these people with Lyme, tick-borne illness, they wind up in medical mental health care right and i'm not well, saying I'm it's with not you, but but uh, so but let, let's let, let's tease this out because i i think they're two different yeah. paths because if people are getting to you and then yeah. your 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 folks are not properly trained that's a different question than i'm asking i'm asking okay. you about the medical doctors who are gaslighting their patients and making it less likely that they're going to get to you at all yeah 
But I think there's gas gaslighting in mental health and medical okay. in, in, in mental health, they're pushing him to psych meds because they don't yeah. recognize it. And in mental health and medical, they're pushing him to psych meds too. And so there's so much confusion and that's why so many people, right? On average, it's five to seven doctors before a Lyme diagnosis. This is a problem that is in our mental and medical health system that we need okay. to address. Okay, I, I I appreciate that. I, I I do appreciate it. So it's, um, it's it's they both suck. So we'll uh, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's getting better because you know honestly because these things are so prevalent that they're the providers have personal experience, and what brings most providers to this industry is that they have a child, they have a family member. I mean, you know, I got involved long before my own child did. And I'm grateful that I got involved because I would have been down. I still went down messy roads, but I didn't go through the same thing that most families do because I knew where to go. And we don't, when, when we tell people it's all in their head, they start believing it. And that's a problem because that means they're not going to get proper medical care. Well, you know, but uh, I would argue it is all in their head. It's all in their head because they have bugs in their brain. And because they have bugs in their brain, the neural pathways are changing or they're, they, they're suffering from inflammation or, you know, there are a lot of other issues that are, are very important to deal with. And I'd argue to you, quite frankly, um, if you accept that it's all in your head, you're more likely to get on a healing pathway faster by dealing with the neurological and the brain issues first right. rather than last. So, But uh, the, the saying, Rich, of all in your head means that there's nothing wrong with you. You're crazy, all. right, right. Yeah, I mean, it's you, you, right? you know, but and I, there's, I, I, you know, nothing you can do about it, which isn't true. But just there's like, a lot you can do. But Dr. Roseanne, just like we we here at Tick Boot Camp want to take control of the word Lyme disease or the terms Lyme disease, we also want to take control over the term it's all in your head, right? Mm -hmm. Because if we take if we can take control over that, then maybe when 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 patients are being gaslit by doctors, it means okay, let me go see a qualified therapist who could help me with my nervous system regulation. And maybe I don't need to see anyone else because now my immune system can function properly. And because my immune system can function properly, maybe we don't have to deal with every, you know, dealing with antibiotics or other types of things that may also have side effects that we don't have to deal with if we if we have a regulated nervous system. So um, I uh, we are at Liza's hard stop. I would talk with you all night. Uh, there are Hours more of conversation, Dr. Roseanne, that I'd really love to have with you. Uh, but I did promise Liza that we would be off at a hard stop. So I, Dr. Roseanne, I absolutely love this conversation. Thank you so much for taking time away from your family to speak with us. And Liza, as always, I love you. You're wonderful. And your questions were wonderful as always. And thank you both for, for doing so much for this community. And Liza, thank you for coming back to our community uh, to help us out with uh, asking Dr. Roseanne uh, so many Thanks really wonderful questions. Me. And yes, and thank you for the opportunity to help me change people's lives because that's really the mission that I'm on, right? And, uh, you know, wherever people are, I hope that, you know, they got something out of this that will help them on their healing journey.